Welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. 50 years ago, Billie Jean King won equal pay at the U.S. Open for women. Stay tuned. All right, guys, so at the Golden Gate Open, so a lot of what this tournament is about is champion, championing equality, fighting to achieve pay parity. So as you guys may know, this is a 125 combined open. So men and women, or women and men, achieve equal pay in all the rounds here at the Golden Gate Open. Now, you know, something like equal pay and parity seems simple for most people, right? You play the same tournaments, you play the same matches, you play the game of tennis, you expect that pay is the same for everybody. Unfortunately, after 50 years, it is not that way. It's actually going the other way. So in the year 2022, men's ATP events was 75% higher than women's WTA events, which is the greatest gap in two decades. So that's why here at the Golden Gate Open, we strive for equality and we fight for parity. Now tonight, we have, in this panel discussion, we have Caroline Samard, Managing Director of Stanford WM Ware, Women's Leadership Innovation Lab. Summer Vernhoeven, Executive Director of USTA NorCal. Carolyn Gann, Executive Director of the California Partner Project. Melissa Pine, Vice President of Global Program development of the WTA, Carol Zhao, current WTA player in discussion and panel with Rosie Casals. Let's go on in and check out the discussion. And welcome to each of our panelists. And before we get into this conversation, I just want to say um, today is a really important moment and opportunity to have this conversation. First, the Golden Gate Open is the first 125 level tournament to uh, institute pay equity or prizes between men and women. So that's a huge milestone for the sport. <laughs> Second, we're celebrating 50 years of equal prize money at the US Open, and we will definitely hear about that history in our panel today. And third, the USDA has sponsored High School Girls Night today, so we also have among us the future of the sport. And uh, before I introduce the panelists, I just want to keep in mind uh, the next generation of players because in their registration, they were invited to submit questions. And Ria, one of the attendees, simply asked, when will girls be paid the same as the boys? And for some reason, when I read the question coming from her, I felt it was a little bit of a gut punch because I said, here's a, here's a young tennis player who's like, when will this happen? But also, I could hear maybe in her question, why are girls getting paid less, right? So we really want to have a conversation today. So I'm joined today by incredible experts. Uh, we have uh, Carolyn Gann, the Executive Director of the California Partners Project. Summer Verhoeven, who's the Executive Director of uh, USTA Northern California. Melissa Pine, who's Vice President of Operations at the WTA. Carol Zhao, a professional tennis player in this tournament and also a Stanford alumna. And of course, Rosie Casals, the Tennis Hall of Famer and absolute legend of this So let's kick it up, Rosie, with you. Um, take us back to that 
uh, that moment where you were kind of coming up in the sport. At that time, it was even women making 90% worse than men, right? So a significant amount of discrepancy. How did you fund yourself? And when did you start noticing that, hmm, maybe this should change? Those are a lot of questions. First of all, going back in time, obviously, uh, probably uh, the open era came into being 68, 1968. Grand Slam uh, was Wimbledon. So at that time, we were contract pros. And that meant before 1968, you couldn't play in any of the tournaments. So we were finally getting paid because we thought Billie Jean, myself, and Frankie Dura, and uh, Ann Jones were the women that went along with the Gonzales and what have you. Uh, Ken Rose, Labor, all the you know, top players that uh, were contract pros. So in our minds, it was always there that money, um, playing tennis, you should get paid. You work just as hard as the guys. And you know, we're thinking, well, you know, this is the time, 1968. Women, you know, finally are going to get paid money. Everybody's going to not get it under the table as usual. And uh, so um, we start realizing that we're, we're not getting paid as much as the guys. We're playing with them during that time, and we're not getting paid. We're not getting the exposure. We're not getting the scheduling. That's because guys are running the tournament. They're the promoters. And so you know, let's travel a little bit faster toward the 70s. And um, that discontent that grew at the at Forest Silt in 1970, where uh, the women realized really that they were not going to get a piece of the pie, and that we had to do something drastically. Uh, we were supposed to play at, at Kramer's uh, Pacific Southwest Tournament, and realized the prize money ratio was 10 to 1, and we asked, what, could, could, could we have equal prize money? Imagine asking equal prize money at that time. And he said, no, I don't care about the women, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, the women regrouped. Gladys Heldman, Billie Jean really were our leaders who said, well, women, wh what are we going to do? Uh, you know, we're going to boycott the, the Pacific Southwest and we're going to play in Houston. Virginia Slim became our uh, sponsor. And, um, you know, I was very fortunate to have won that first tournament, so I can always say I'm the first winner of of the Virginia Slims, but um, that really was the beginning. The original nine uh, players who risked it all by taking a chance and and defying the uh, you know old establishment by saying that women deserve more, and that really was the birth of women's sense with Virginia Slims uh, behind it. Uh, really, uh, without them, I have to say that uh, I, I don't think women's tennis would be where it is. So we we owe a lot to that. Thank you so much for sharing that history and that story. And it's so important for us to keep in mind as we continue pushing for change, understanding the change that has come before and how far it has gotten us. Carol, how does hearing Rose's story resonate with you as a current uh, tennis player? Uh, it's very profound, of course, because um, I owe, I feel like, so many of the opportunities I've gotten in my tennis career um, and in my life, really, uh, to to what Rosie and, and a lot of the original nine have done, um, being able to play on the tour now, being able to study and play tennis here um, back in the day. Um, and so, yeah, we're all very extremely grateful for that. Um, but I would say for my current perspective as a player uh, on tour now, um, there's still a lot that could be done. Uh, you know, I think um, just recently I was playing a, a combined tournament with, uh, with men and with the same level. Um, and we played in the same stadium in front of the same fans. Uh, and then later on, I, I realized that I was being paid about 3.5 times less uh, than my male counterparts. Um, and that's not something that I usually pay much attention to, but uh, just happened to be um, at a combined event. And so it really kind of stuck, stuck out to me and stayed with me. And, um, you know, just wondering why there is such a discrepancy there. Um, and so, you know, growing up all through junior tennis, we uh, play with the guys, we train the same way, uh, we come out through the same uh, pathways, um, and suddenly, you know, when you become a pro, there's, there's a change in, in how much 
um, you're being compensated for what we feel like is um, an equal amount of work. So um, yeah, really excited to, to hear about how um, everyone is pushing, pushing this forward. Thank you so much for uh, that perspective. And Summer, in, in our conversations, you talk about looking at pay, but also the entire structure of NF. Like, how do we create more gender equity in the entire system? Would you share a little bit your thoughts on that? Yes, definitely. One of the things that I think is extremely important is that we start looking at the culture within the tennis community and how we are all involved in the tennis community and what that means and the impact that we could have um, and share stories and talk about it because oftentimes we haven't talked about it because like just mentioned, you know, we, we oftentimes don't know those things because us as players, we're just, we're just doing our best, we're training, we're just trying to get into events and whatnot and it's not something that we're focused on. So. Definitely, it's, it's definitely a time of change, and it's a, it's a whole culture change, but it's something that we all need to start talking about and sharing stories about and what it means to us. So it could definitely help our players in the future. Uh, thank you. I definitely feel like the, what tennis is going through with this conversation is happening in multiple sectors. So Carolyn, I'd love to hear from you. Um, what are your thoughts on how this sport reflects kind of a bigger pattern of gender inequity in society, and why is the California Partners Project involved in this conversation? Sure. So I love what you said, Summer, about let's talk about it. Let's you know pull back the veil a little bit and talk about what's going on with this. So currently in the United States, on average, women earn 82 cents for every dollar that a man earns. And the statistics are even worse for mothers and for women of color. And to put that into some context, that ends up being about $400,000 over the course of someone's career. So if you think about that, that's $400,000 that might go towards savings, towards retirement, towards building wealth. And the progress is very, very slow. Um, I know there's some high school students that are here today and they will be nearing retirement by the time uh, the current rate of progress that we are reaching pay equity in this country. The good news is that California has some of the strongest pay equity laws in the country. And there are 130 California-based companies that have already signed something called the California Equal Pay Pledge. That's an initiative that my organization, the California Partners Project, is working on with the Office of the First Partner, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, and with the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. So 130 companies that have gone above and beyond and have said they want to be champions for change when it comes to pay equity. That's fabulous. And I love how California is leading the way. Um, you know, let's talk about the arguments we sometimes hear against pay equity. So some people in the world of tennis say, well, you know, what's fair is that men should get more money because maybe they have more attendees in the sport, maybe their ratings are higher on television, maybe they get more sponsorship money. And really, this is about the market, right? It's about the ROI, it's about hard cash, uh, how much money you bring in as a player. Um, and I was thinking about, hmm, is this true, right, this narrative, is it true? And in fact, no, it turns out it's much more nuanced than this. And to give you an example of how, uh, how much money and viewership women can generate with the appropriate support, at the US Open in 2022, Four out of the six most viewed matches at, on ESPN were women's matches. And in fact, it broke a 45 uh, history of uh, telecast of TV of tennis ever, especially with um, during a Williams match. So it doesn't have to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, Rosie was talking about we weren't getting attention, we are getting bad schedules, we weren't getting the opportunities, so you have to think about the whole system. Melissa, how do you help your members advocate in the face of these kinds of arguments? Um, so obviously, you know, the WTA was formed on the principles of equality and empowerment of women. And, you know, hearing Rosie talk about how it all got started and signing a $1 contract um, just 50 years ago, right? And, and now here we are 50 years later, um, the athletes are playing for over $180 billion in, in prize money. So 
We've come a very, very long way, and tennis is the leading professional sport for women globally, um, but we still you know, are dealing with this. So um, it's really behind the premise of what we do at the WTA every day is to drive forward um, these principles. And, and recently, uh, the WTA has announced a very exciting new strategy uh, for a pathway towards equal pay, as well as a revised tour structure, so we're calling it circuit structure, um, to you know provide and drive the um, sustainability, but also you know the economic growth of the tour, so that you know we get to where we need to be with equal prize money. So um, you know the the premise of of this strategy is really. Um, commitment to equal prize money at 1,500 events by 2027 and non-combined events by 2033. So it's obviously, uh, it's going to take a lot to do that, uh, a lot of revenue growth, a lot of driving and accelerating the value of our assets, which can then be, um, you know, put into our tournaments and to our prize money. So. Um, we also announced in March, many of you have heard about the partnership with CBC. So it's unprecedented to, that WTA has partnered with a venture capital firm, uh, and we've now formed WTA Ventures. And the purpose of this is obviously to, again, increase the value of our assets, take it into our own hands. We know that you know the commercial world is not giving us the same you know, value of our assets as the men. So we're taking it into our own hands, also looking for new revenue streams, and this is what's gonna get us to where we need to be in 2027. That's a really exciting vision, and I know, you know, for some, including, I've been working on, on this kind of gender equity uh, topic for a long time, and sometimes you feel like, wow, why do we have to wait so many years? Right? But at the same time, what we can hear from everyone tonight is this is a multi-generational fight for justice, really. And uh, you have to think about it as building blocks, right? We're dismantling inequity kind of brick by brick, right? Um, Summer, how do you think about how these kind of equity issues influences who enters the sport? And you were talking about to a women's representation in different aspects of tennis. Did you mention that? Yes, so when it comes to the, the programming side of bringing girls into sports, um, that is something that we are consistently looking at and doing a ton of research on and um, making sure that we have the proper programs and really trying to evaluate the, the issues that girls have when they are competing in sports and in tennis and addressing those and really trying to fix those so that as they want to start playing tennis, we have a good entryway into the tennis system for them to be able to participate in. So it is a, it's something that's an ongoing thing and we're trying to address that across the country and um, really try to get as many people playing as possible. And Rosie, the slogan of the Virginia Slims tournament was, you've come a long way, baby. And I was raised in the 80s and I remember those ads. They were kind of very feminist, very empowering, and were showcasing women from all walks of life, looking very empowered. So as you reflect on the journey traveled in the sport, have we come a long way? Oh, I would say we've come a long way, absolutely. When I hear about 180 million in prize money, Billie Jean broke that, uh, her $100,000 in 1971, probably playing about 38 tournaments, uh, singles and doubles, and you know, in addition to playing the Grand Slam. So um, obviously the opportunities are there to make a great living, and during our time, you know, it was difficult. You really did have to play as many tournaments, and you know, you played three events because you wanted the prize money. So. It was a, a, a tough way to get the money, but uh, at least it was there, and to see the growth and, and how, how global um, the sports become, and, and the media, uh, the, it, you know, 
be, being being able to to read about it and, and the social media, the way things uh, get out so quickly nowadays compared to our our ways of trying to get the media to pay attention to us, to write about us, to get to know who we were, what we were doing, what we were fighting for. So there are a lot of good assets now, and uh, you know what can I say? We've come a long way, Dave. I want to make sure we have time for each of you to share what people listening to this conversation in the audience and then later on social media, what can they do? What's an action you would love for people to take based on this conversation moving forward? And I'll start with you, Carolyn. Sure. I would encourage everybody to be an advocate for the women in your lives and especially in your workplace. And if you work for a company or if you run a company, consider signing the California Equal Pay Pledge. Very concrete action. Go ahead. Yes, I would definitely like to obviously say I, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> but at the same time, I would also like everybody, like I had mentioned before, to start sharing stories and really talking about what the issues are. Um, the tennis has definitely come a long way, and there was a wonderful press release that actually just came out today about the U.S. Open, and we should be so proud that Stacey Allister is the first woman Grand Slam tournament director, and that is of the U.S. Open, and that's huge for our country to have somebody representing us who is a female. So very proud of that. But again, just really, we need to start talking about the issues and really sharing stories and really just trying to reiterate what tennis means to us, how we see our future in tennis, and then also too, how it also, like we are hoping that also people could eventually become coaches and um, really stay in the game for a long time. So it's really to get the, the word out about tennis and, and growing. Yeah, and I think just adding on to that, um, exposing you know more girls to these opportunities, your, your daughters, your nieces, your sisters, whatever it is, exposing them to, to tennis or other opportunities that will empower them in the future, you know, to grow and have their voice and, and use their voice. And you know, obviously men and boys are, are a part of the whole discussion, but um, I think really just uh, exposing and empowering um, the next generation. Yeah, and I think from, I mean, in my position, probably something I've tried is just please watch more women's tennis. Um, <laughs> Um, as long as we get more butts and seats and more eyes on the screen, um, it's really, I, I feel very confident that we have a lot of meaningful stories to tell as women who are professional athletes who do sacrifice so much um, for the sport and uh, who really are, you know, passionate and, and, and want to put on a um, good, good show for all of you, so. Well, I, w I would have to say, you know, United, we, we stand, really. Um, that To me, that's the biggest thing, is that we have to keep connecting the dots every generation. It doesn't matter, you know, sports, uh, business, uh, uh, journalists, what, what, whatever. If everybody does their little bit, you know, to enhance uh, women and everything that uh, they are a part of, and, and one thing that Billie Jean continues to say is that um, we do need the men. We, we do need them to support um, in order to be equal and be able to look at one another. Uh, the respect has to be there. And, uh, you know, women can be very, very powerful when they're united. Boy, they can, they can, they can move the world. Believe me, they can move the world. And you've certainly shown that yourself in your career. Um, there's a couple of audience questions. Um, one of them is concrete, and it came from two of our high school participants. There's Melina and Mayuko from Bagby School both asked if you have any advice on staying strong after a loss, or what's the most important thing you can do after losing a match? No, after you win a match. <laughs> um, well, I'd actually be curious to hear what, what Rosie had to say about this because I feel like I have a lot to learn on this front. But um, I think having like a really solid support team around you is very important. Um, tennis is a really lonely sport and you go through a lot of ups and downs uh, by yourself. And 
I think just being able to really talk about how you're feeling, what you're feeling, and how we can move forward with people that you really trust um, is really important. I, I uh, heard an expression once, and something I, I like to, to live by. It's, it's either you win or you learn. And so I think you know when you win, great. Uh, I think but the most important thing is really learning how, you know, how, how to lose and how to take the learnings from your loss, right? So we're all going to lose, right? We're not going to win all the time, but the ability to be able to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, what can I learn from this and how am I going to be better next time? I think that's hard to do in theory, but if you can practice it, then, then you can get there. Yes, I think I, I, I think that's the best thing to do is uh, you always have to accept the defeat and not be afraid of it. Um, yeah, the learning part is very important because uh, if you learn not to lose and learn to win, you're going to feel a whole lot better. And she has won many, many, many titles to prove that point. <laughs> On that note, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight for this extraordinary conversation. And thank you in the audience and thanks to the fans. And I love the message of keep watching women's tennis and keep uh, supporting women in the sport.